I came out in June 2014. It was new student orientation at Westchester University. And of course, the question comes up. Somebody asked me, are you gay? I wasn't wearing this face at the time. I played it a little bit more discreet. So at the time, I told them I'm bisexual. In October 2014, I came out again. It was my mom's birthday, and my parents were dropping me back off at my college dorm. As I was leaving, I said, I have something to tell you. I'm gay. Okay, bye. Happy birthday, mom. <laughs> <laughs> now, that is what many would consider to be my coming out story. The signature piece to my life narrative as a gay man. We see this sentiment expressed in our media, rhetoric, and entertainment. And while the coming out story is a powerful component to the LGBTQ plus identity, it does not solely define my self-actualization as a queer person. That coming out story I just told you is the least interesting part about me. Girl, I got so many better stories. <laughs> Following the celebration of National Coming Out Day six days ago, it's time we understand the true value of coming out as not just a single story, but a preliminary milestone in the livelihood, struggles, and resilience of gender and sexual minorities after we come out of the closet. Traditional psychological models theorized coming out to be a strict, sequential, and step-like process. As I started openly identifying as a gay man, I realized the contrary. I had a choice to welcome certain people to this aspect of my identity and found myself repeatedly coming out to different people. Today, I'm out to my relatives as a gay man, but not as a drag queen. I'm out to my coworkers as a gay man and a drag queen. And all at the same time, my dentist, my landlord, and my grandma think I'm straight. Each time I come out, I produce a new coming out story and face the risk of judgment, discrimination, or violence, which made me question the concept of a singular linear coming out story. I found in the 2015 publication, Professional Counselors, researchers suggested the notion of the coming out cycle as an alternative to traditional models. The importance of this cyclical approach is that it addresses the ongoing stress that queer people face with each interaction that involves us coming out. Upon stepping out of the closet, I immediately and progressively felt the challenge of trying to present and be my true self while simultaneously learning about my real self. And to much of my disappointment, there was no new student orientation after coming out of the closet. Much of the dark skeletons and monsters that accompanied me in the closet, I could still feel eating at me. My community has a history of being told that our gender and sexual identities make us abominations, criminals, or mentally ill perverts. And these messages stirred in my head and internalized as I tried to openly navigate my authentic self as a queer person. They were finally challenged in my nursing assessment class. Go figure. <laughs> my professor shared nursing articles on the numerous health disparities that LGBTQ patients encounter and nurses' role in advocating for LGBTQ health. And this was my first example of queer culture and nursing professionalism coinciding in the same space and conversation, which ignited a passion in me. I was suddenly overwhelmed with the numerous health concerns that LGBTQ patients specifically face. Beyond the closet, gender and sexual minorities are coming into a world where they are 120% more at risk of reporting homelessness than their heterosexual cisgender counterparts, as reported in the 2017 Voices of Youth Count National Survey. Beyond the closet, queer youth make up 40% of the homeless youth population, while also comprising 7% of the total youth population, as reported in the 2017 LGBT Homeless Provider Survey by UCLA. Furthermore, the survey also found that 27% of queer youth who are homeless also engage in survival sex. 
or exchanging sex for basic needs, such as a home, food, or clothes. And these are only the incidences that have been reported. While all at the same time, LGBTQ people face discrimination in housing and healthcare based on the current legislature and potential Supreme Court standings that do not and may not include these protections. Gender and sexual minorities face barriers and challenges in meeting their basic needs by identifying and expressing themselves authentically. Advancing beyond basic needs, my community continues to face a reality where they are at higher risk of receiving a psychiatric diagnosis, abusing substances, or taking their own life, as reported in Healthy People 2020. The narrative for many queer people is often characterized by our internalization of other people's homophobic and transphobic insecurities about us. Then shame becomes our skin. The resulting depression, anxiety, or trauma can manifest itself into toxic thoughts and risky behaviors from increased tobacco use to anonymous condomless hookups or sexualized drug use, all in order to relieve a persisting loneliness that follows us in the workplace, in our relationships, and all throughout our lives. And even in the times when we want to embrace and express our proud selves or show small signs of affection with our partner in public, the risk of safety has to be calculated or otherwise it is compromised. I've seen this firsthand in some of my own personal experiences or in my profession as a sexual health nurse and clinical case manager for people living with HIV. The pathway to LGBTQ self-actualization is fraught with ongoing shame and struggle that extends past our coming out story. While society prescribes struggle onto our trajectory to actualizing our LGBTQ selves, there are stories of queer success that we can celebrate and aspire to in order to unlock our own queer resilience. Australian activist Alexander Leon tweeted in January 2020, queer people don't get to grow up as ourselves. We grow up playing a version of ourselves that sacrifices authenticity to minimize humiliation and prejudice. The massive task of our adult lives is to unpick which parts of ourselves are truly us and which parts we've created to protect us. And that is our coming in story. How we come into the world, come into our own skin, come into our own spirit and self. Growing up, I rarely felt comfortable with myself. When I hit middle school and lost all my friends because Pokemon stopped being cool by seventh grade, <laughs> People would not hesitate to remind me of all the traits and qualities that made me a girly boy. People would make fun of me for being gay before I even knew I was gay. People would whisper that faggot when I walked into a room. And I started to dissect every little bit of myself. The pitch of my voice, the angle of my wrist, the way that I walked, the switch of my hips, the colors I wore in my clothes, the way I looked at my nails, the words I would use, all to hide the hints that might indicate that I'm a flamboyant gay. This hyper-analytical self-awareness would be my inner coach and inner saboteur even after stepping out of the closet. Upon coming out, I saw a fairy tale narrative of gay love and partying that I always saw with the straight couples I watched on TV, read about in books, or listened to in music. Yet I didn't find that. With a chaotic sense of self and a strong desire to find answers, I place myself in dangerous situations, objectifying relationships, and a toxic mindset that still felt suppressive in search of a community. During college, my friends convinced me to compete in my school's drag show, and I ended up winning the show, Hanny. <laughs> Which ultimately inspired me to start my drag career from scratch as Mandy Mango, right as I started to begin my career as a newly licensed registered nurse. Through the process of teaching myself drag makeup, 
wig styling, sewing, and performing in these past two years, I've found that loving community and have learned from them how I want to present myself to the world in a way that is comfortable and confident. I've seen my drag as an opportunity to turn faggot into fierce, to overcome my shame and embrace my real self from the curled tips of my real hair to the pointed ends of my six inch stilettos. And if I'm a faggot, then I'm one fine looking faggot, Mary. <laughs> and before I step onto that stage, I pack away all the monsters and inner demons in my head and put them back in the closet, right next to that ugly dress your friend got you. And I close that door. And when that music comes on, I, I don't need to come out. Because I'm not just surviving. I'm not just living as a queer person. But I'm thriving. With Mandy Mango, I feel powerful. <laughs> I feel fulfilled. And I believe that my space in this world is finally valuable. And Mandy's drag journey seeks to blend nursing intellect and drag art to empower people similarly and continue the legacy of drag activism by being a loud voice and platform for LGBTQ health education and advocacy. That is what I want my coming in story to be. So write and manifest your coming in story for you and only you. And to our straight cisgender allies, listen to our stories when we share them. Support us in finding our resilience. Empathize with us. And with our trust in disclosing our experiences to you, we hope that you take stride and stand up when the time comes, when there's a bully, an injustice, a chance to vote for supportive and inclusive leadership. You take action and advocate for the LGBTQ people in your lives, including me. <laughs> On the TV show RuPaul's Drag Race, there's a segment when the top four deliver a speech of what they would tell their younger selves. And so yes, I've already prepared mine. I would tell my younger self to get out of your damn head and into those heels because you are truly stronger in that armor than they want you to think. I know you'll always find reasons to guard your real personality. I know you'll go looking for validation in all the wrong places to heal the hurt. But beyond your closet, there are so many people who love you and accept you, who will be there for you when you come out to your parents, who will yell at the drunk guy who calls you a fag, who will go with you to your first HIV test, who will glue on your nails and fix your wig, who will genuinely love you and support you for being you. You're thick-skinned, you're hardworking, you do some stupid stuff, and you're a very lucky person. And I can't wait to see the rest of your coming in story. Thank you. Thank you.